Okay, we continue with our series this morning titled what? Titled what? Repair the altar. Repair the altar. This was the word of the Lord to me on the 16th of December. I entered my study for the final preparation for the Holy Ghost service, which is a miracle service. And then the first thing I had was repair the altar. I went into prayer for the next two hours thereafter. God began to give me clarity about what he's about to do, what he wants to do, and the need for preparation. And the very first act of preparation is to repair the altar. Repair the altar. And then, of course, he led me to the book of 1 Kings chapter 18, and we see the progression there. Actually, the story started from verse 20 down to verse 46. Or we see the progression there. Um, the first thing that happened was that there was darkness in the land. That was actually what precipitated the whole drama. There was darkness in the land. The land was in a complete state of darkness. Idolatry had taken root in the system that we are worshiping Baal and serving idols. And that, of course, attracted famine in the land and all kinds of um, um, all kinds of evil. And after about three years plus of suffering. God, in his mercy, decided to send his servant Elijah to change and to turn things around. Because God is merciful. God is merciful. How many of you know that God is merciful? Uh, if not that he's merciful, you won't be here. Yeah. The Bible says that it's of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. It is of his mercy that we are not consumed. And so God in his mercy sent Elijah. And when Elijah stepped into the scene, the first thing he asked them was, how long will you people be here and there? How long halt you between two opinions? If God is God, serve him. And if God is not God and Baal is God, or proves himself to be God, then serve Baal. And so he said, Let's prepare altars. I prepare an altar for the Most High God. You prepare altars for your gods. And the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And so he gave them the opportunity to try first. They tried to call upon their gods for several hours from morning till evening, actually. And their gods went on break that day. What a day to go on break. Of course, when the true God shows up, every false God shuts up. Am I correct? Yeah. Um, I gave you an example about two or three Sundays ago. So that was what happened here. They called upon their gods, their gods didn't answer. Elijah mocked them. Say so maybe he's, he, he traveled. Maybe if you shout louder, your God will hear. Can you imagine that kind of God? And that's the kind of God some people are still serving. The gods that go on errand. So at the end of the day, cut the long story short, when it was Elijah's turn to call upon his God, the first thing he did before calling upon God was to repair the altar. The altar was in a state of disrepair. And I also found out to be true in several cases, several examples in the scripture, that preceding the manifestation of God is usually the repairing of the altar. And repairing of the altar takes different forms. In Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, God said, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. 
But first of all, they have to humble themselves and pray. Which was what happened here. Elijah told them, repair the altar. The altar basically is a place where you meet with God. The first man to build an altar was Noah in Genesis 8. After all, Abraham built altars. Isaac built an altar. Jacob built altars. Uh, Moses, uh, mo uh, practically all of them, including David and Solomon, they all built altars. Altars are that meeting point between um, the spirit world and the natural. It could be demonic spirit world and the natural or divine, which is heavenly, and the natural. That's why um, if you go to certain junctions, especially in the southwest, you will see altars erected on bridges, um, even weird places. You wonder, do people in, living in this kind of area, do they serve idols? Some posh areas, even on the island, you find altars erected, pots and sacrifices, because the altar is useless without sacrifice. I'm going to talk about that um, by next month by God's grace. The altar is useless without sacrifice. So the altar has to be repaired first, which is your meeting place, your fellowship with God. It has to be repaired. You have to return back to your place of fellowship. You are trusting God for a new move of God in your life. Maybe there are certain things that are happening in your life that are inconsistent with the reality you expect or the reality that God has designed for you. The first step is not to begin to ask God, oh God, do it, like you are enchanting. Oh God, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. That's not the first thing to do. The first thing to do is to fix your relationship with God because really God wants you more than anything else. And there is nothing God cannot do to get your attention. That's important. There is really nothing he, he will not do just to get your attention. So it's better to give him that attention and save him the effort of having to do anything to get it. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. So Elijah repairs the altar, one he calls upon God and the fire falls on the altar. The Bible says in the book of Leviticus chapter 6, um, verse 11 to 13, that the fire must be kept burning on the altar. That the altar must never be without fire at any point in time. And same goes with your fellowship with God. There must never be a time where you take a break, where there is no fire burning on your altar. Where that relationship, that fellowship between you and God is not vital, is not active. There must never be a time like that. Because in that place of fellowship with God, so much happens. Number one, and most importantly, you are changed to be more like him. The Bible says, as we behold him as in a mirror, you are changed from one degree of glory to another. That's the most important thing, but not, not the only thing. The next thing that happens in the place um, uh, of your fellowship with God when your altar is burning is that the heat from the altar is transmitted into your life. The fire from the altar is transmitted into your life. You become a walking, moving altar. Somebody was sharing something with me in the course of the week that because she's into real estate. And one of those times, several weeks ago, when she went to negotiate for some property, some acres, hectares of land, and the ballet of the land came up to meet her and all that. And, you know, jokingly, she just held him here, like, you know, ba ballet, you know, and said, if, you know, spoke to him. She said she touched the charm. 
And that day, she almost passed out. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. That day, she almost passed out. And that's because, um, you see, the fire she carried at that time was small. Because he should be the one passing out. Oh, yes. The fire was little. <laughs> we finished one prayer meetings, a meeting several years ago when I was, you know, when God was nurturing me. We used to go somewhere to pray for three hours. I was a young man then, youth actually, probably 19 years. And I had about two other friends that the man of God was drilling. So every Wednesday, three hours, we are there praying. No prayer point, just praying in tongues. Serious drilling. So we had done it for months, and by this time, you know, we are, we, we are moving altars as teenagers. So after one of those prayer meetings, one of the guys left got to a Kedja bus stop, was standing and waiting for bus. It was around December. You know, at December, there is a rise in demonic activities. Disappearances, ritual murders, and all that. So, this guy came with a charm and hit my friend. My friend didn't know what happened. But I just knew that the guy hit him. He just ignored him you know, kept waiting for the boss. A minute late, later, the, he heard the guy shouting a few meters away and then rushed to him, knelt and started begging him. He said, what happened? The guy began to confess. He said, I hit you with a charm. But unfortunately, my own disappeared. Power, past power. Are you with me? Power, past power. So that, that's what should have happened that few weeks ago when this lady touched that guy. But I'm sure if she goes back and touch him now, because things have changed between then and now, she has learned her lesson. Glory to Jesus. That's why, that's why God said, you must keep your altar burning. Burning. Satan doesn't give you a memo. Dear Francisca, on the 28th of January 2004, 24, I shall be visiting. And when I come, no, if, if, if that happened, it would be easy. When a thief, an arm robber gives you notification, you prepare. There are many ways to prepare. You can run. Yes, it's part of preparation. You can clear the house so that when it comes, it sees nothing. It's preparation. Or you can gather armed men. Praise the name of Jesus. But the enemy doesn't give that kind of memo. That's why you must leave and stay prepared. Leave and stay prepared. You, you, you are not you are not ordinary. You are not ordinary. You are not... I hear people say, I'm just a human being. No! You are not just a human being. You are a spirit being living in a human body. You are not just a human being. You are a spirit being. I've, heard all, I've experienced all kinds of visitations, including demonic visitations. Especially when I was much younger. But I was already cooked in God. So none of those encounters could scare me. It was one night after prayer, around 1 a.m. or so, I, I went to bed. One minute, as I lay on bed, one minute, there was a demonic physical appearance in my bedroom. I stood up, still on my bed, but got up. Before I could say a word, 
it disappeared, but it was a female figure I saw. Long hair. Head down to the feet, but naked. And I said, pointed in that direction, my window direction, I said, if you are not afraid, come back. I went to bed. Of course, they knew too well not to come back. I wasn't a pastor then. I was just maybe about 21. And I never discussed with any human being until almost two years later. I didn't consider it necessary. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Because I heard of I read of Smith Winglesworth's story. He was in his room sleeping and he heard some noise in his uh, um, sitting room. At night, he got up, went to the sitting room and saw Satan appear as skeleton. He said, oh, it's you. He eased, went back to bed. I listened to that message again and again and again. It built faith in me when I was young. I knew when that time comes and he shows up, <laughs> I would also treat him as a non-entity. In fact, the one that appeared in my room, God told me afterwards, was a spirit of death. He said, but there are some assignments you don't go to because you don't even know who they are sending you to. It's only when you get there, discover that, ah, Eli. <laughs> There's no point. Let me go back. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. And so the fire fell. God wants every child of his to be a moving altar. Not just to have an altar, but to be a moving altar. You are a solution wherever God plants you. You must never be confused like every other person is confused. There are some things we say that shouldn't be heard from us. I'm just confused. No, you cannot be confused. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, the B part, New King James Version, that you have the mind of Christ. Did you ever see Jesus confused? And Jesus gets to the well and says, Ah, I'm, I'm just confused. Peter, let's brainstorm. What do you think I should do? Or at that point in time when they told him, pay your tax, and he had no money. They ah, you people have finally caught me. I hope I won't go to jail now. I'm just confused. There's no money right now. Because Judas, as usual. No, he was not confused. He said, Peter, go. He knew exactly what to do. At every point in time, he knew what to do. You see, when you function with the mind of Christ, you will know what to do at every point in time. I've shared this story many times. When I was in the university, there was a, a day the lecturer decided to embarrass me. In fact, it was my HOD who was taking that lecture that day. And he had warned me not to come late. But that day, in the place of burning incense, I didn't know when the time was passed. When I finished burning incense, let me clarify, not fiscal incense. Don't go and say they burn incense in this church. We don't burn incense. The incense we burn is worship and prayer. Okay? So I finished, and I, I, I went to school. As I was coming in, I wanted to sneak in and sit down. Is there not here? Come. Is <laughs> there come? Come and solve this question. This equation. Hey, I knew it was embarrassment. And so I walked slowly. You see, it's important when you read the word meditate. I remembered when Jesus was giving a tough question with the woman caught in adultery. They wanted him to say something that they would use to hold him. If he says, stone him, stone her. He has violated his law of love. If he says, release her, 
He has violated the law of Moses that will stone him. So Jesus stooped down and began to write. Within those few seconds, I believe he was connecting with heavenly frequency to download answer. So, as soon as the lecturer told me that, began to walk slowly. I didn't look at the board. He says, Holy Spirit, show me. Holy Spirit, teach me. Teach me. Teach me. When I got there, I looked up, took the chalk, looked at the question, and then began to write. After writing, I gave him the chalk. He looked at it. The student looked at it. Everybody started clapping. I got the answer. Ask me today what was the question. I don't know. It was by inspiration. If only you will ask. He said, Jesus said, ye are gods. Ye are gods. Ye are gods. You see, gods are consulted. Gods are consulted. Gods don't consult anyone. Gods are consulted. So in that sector, God wants you to rise and become the light in that sector. When Jesus said you are the light of the world, he didn't say you are the light of the church. You are the light of the world means you are to go out there and shine and be the God in that sector. Be the one to demonstrate God in that sector. The Bible says creation always the manifestation of the sons of God. But if you continue to see yourself as ordinary, you will continue to function as an ordinary person. You will continue to function as an ordinary person. I also put that to, I mean, I put that to work many times. I've told you about the story of, again, when I was in school during the military regime, when um, I, I was arrested by some soldiers, I entered the bus. The bus was full of soldiers going to their barracks. And then I was carrying an army bag. So as soon as I entered the bus, they just pulled the bag from me. Say, identify yourself. I said, I'm a student. We are a student. Okay. You come to the barracks with us and continue your school. Sit down. So I sat down. And then we got to the final bus stop. We got to the final bus stop. As soon as we stopped, we, we stepped down. There was one elderly man opposite who knew that because their barracks was there, so he knew their activities. And he knew that once a young man is in the midst of soldiers like that, the guy's in trouble. So he walked up to them and he said, my children, please leave him. Bass, boost, they slapped the man, elderly man, bent like this. But the man was on the floor. As we are going, I saw my course mate, my classmate, say, ah, Brad Lawrence. He rushed up to him, Brad Lawrence, and he was asking me, what's happening? Boss, bass, the guy ran. But you know what? Heaven bears me witness. With all these signs I was seeing, there was no idea of fear. I knew it's not possible that they would raise hand to touch me. It cannot happen. I knew that. No iota of fear. Then later on, the, 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 their leader who was a sergeant came up to me and said, just give us some money, whatever you have, we'll release you. I was wearing a yellow trouser then, 1989, as I remember. Yellow trouser. I put my hand in the pocket. I brought out the money. I say, it's not like the money is not there. But I'm not giving you. You can imagine how young I was then. <laughs> and I've just seen signs. Just seen some people <laughs> receiving, collecting. <laughs> I brought out the money. I say, I, I'm not giving you. I knew it was not possible that they would touch me. How? Want to die? A moving altar. Can you see an altar you want to... When we got to a few meters 
to the barracks. I prayed. Because I was traveling from Enugu to Lagos. And this were going to delay me. I said, God confused them. Underneath my breath, God confused them, confound them. So I can go. Not up to 30 seconds. I'm not saying one minute. Up to 30 seconds after I prayed that prayer. I don't know what happened. But all I saw was that they started fighting. There were about eight of them. They started fighting among themselves. They won't carry my bag. Drop the bag to fight. Ah, when they dropped the bag, I collected my bag. I crossed the road, entered the next bus. I was gone. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. We are talking about operating supernaturally natural and naturally supernatural. But it's a consciousness you carry. You must carry that consciousness. If you keep seeing yourself as ordinary, ordinary me, ordinary man, uh, the Bible says they will die like mere men. They will die like mere men. Why? Because they know not that they are gods. They know not that they are gods. Tell your neighbor, I am a god. Oh yes, don't be afraid to say it. Jesus said so. He said, ye are gods. Ye are gods. Okay, let's move on now. Time is already fast spent. And of course, the fire fell. The people believed, verse 39. The people believed. And then, verse 40, the evil priests and altars were judged. The evil priests and altars were judged in verse 40. Verse 41, Elijah said, I hear a sound of the abundance of rain. I hear a sound of the abundance of rain. Verse 41. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The sound of the abundance of rain. How does it relate with us? That's when you begin to pick signals in the spirit that God is up to something in your life within a season. When you begin to pick signals that God is about to do something, begin to feel, begin to have an impression in your heart. That, you know, there's something that God is about to do. God is about to move me to the next level. It, it could be in your business. It could be in your career. It could be in your ministry. It could be whatever. You just pick certain signals that something is about to happen. That is the sound of the abundance of rain. Now, now, note that all of them didn't hear the sound. It was Elijah who heard the sound. He said, I hear the sound. So stop waiting for others to hear the sound you heard. Because the sound is specific to you. Yes, sometimes if you are a leader, God can give you a sound that covers your leadership domain or terrain or sphere. But otherwise, when you hear a sound, it's usually for you. Don't, don't, don't think that others will do what you are doing. Now, they can't do what you are doing because they didn't hear what you heard. They can't make the commitment you are making because they didn't hear what you heard. He said, I hear the sound. There is a sound of the abundance of rain. It's sound. Now, this is the sound, not the sight. He didn't see. He only heard the sound. He picked something up in the spirit. But sadly for many people, that's where they stop. They hear the sound of the abundance of rain and they begin to celebrate. But the fact that there is a sound does not mean that the rain will fall. Something has to happen for the sound to be converted into physical rainfall. There has to be a conversion process because the sound you are hearing is from the realm of the spirit. You are picking up signals about what is happening in the realm of the spirit already. Your Kairos moment, a season of dramatic change in your life, supernatural intervention or interception of processes to cause your certain things and then move you to your next dimension. So you are hearing the sound, but something has to happen. Give me the next verse quickly. Um, give me the 
NLT. New Living Translation. NLT. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of the Mount Camel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. So Elijah heard the sound. Ahab went to eat and drink because he didn't hear the sound. So others may go and eat and drink, but you don't go and eat and drink. In fact, sometimes two people can be in the house. Some, one person picks the sound. The other person may continue to eat and drink, but you have an obligation to do what Elijah did. That's what a lot of people do not do, and they have aborted dreams, aborted vision. So God shows them, I'm about to do something in your life, and then it remains in the realm of I'm about to do. And eventually, they stop having that sensation, they stop picking that signal, it's over. That season is over. Why? They never brought it forth. For the Bible says, as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth. There has to be a betting. You picked up something in the spirit. What you do next is to go into the bet position in prayer. As soon as Zion travailed, Zion has got to travail to bring forth. There's something, there's a pregnancy in the spirit that you need to push out. Listen, um, um, Baby delivery doesn't start and stop in pregnancy. If every woman who conceives eventually gives birth, that would be wonderful. But you know it's not true. Many conceive but don't give birth. And some, within two months, it's gone. Some three months. Sadly, some get to nine months and then get to the delivery day and are not able to push out. Not able to push out. That's why scripture says in Isaiah 66, it says, will I bring to bed and not give strength to bring forth? So you need strength to bring forth in prayer. And, and your carousel moment is not a time where you say, I don't feel like praying. Forget about feeling. That's not... you. At that point in time, you are not in the realm of feeling anymore. You are in the realm of necessity. You are in the realm of necessity. This has got to be done. I don't want to miss this season. The, Jesus wept in Luke chapter, chapter 19 verse 44. Why? Because the people did not pick up signals that their visitation had come. So they missed that season. They missed the season. And because they missed it, he wept. Why did he weep? Because he understood the implication of missing a season. Do, listen, you may have missed season in the past. Don't miss anyone. Because you are not going to live here forever. You are not meant to sell her. You are here for a time. And you can't spend all your time missing carous moments. You pick up signals that God is up to something in your life. Put aside all the frivolities of life. Things you have been engaging for so long and has not benefited you, put them aside for once. Shut down social media if you need to. Cut off, you know, some unnecessary interaction. And go into prayer. Because what you are about to bet can alter generations for good. But if you don't bet it, if you allow it to be aborted, it will also affect generations. So God gives you a spiritual responsibility to bet something. And it's important that you push it out in prayer. The Bible said, said Elijah went to Mount Carmel and then he bowed down his knees, put his face in between his legs and he prayed. Mountain, when we say we are going to the mountain in the New Testament terminology, we are talking about what? Fasting. So more like Elijah fasted and prayed. And what happened? Verse, um, verse 43. And said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And seven times he said, go again. He said, that's intercession. That's praying until something happens. Isaiah 60, 62, verse 6 and 7 God's recommendation. You pray until something happens. 
The first time he said, go and check. The man went and checked and came back. He said, I don't see anything. And it can be discouraging. When somebody comes and says, I don't see anything. The second time he went and he came back and said, I don't see anything. But guess what? Elijah remained the place of prayer. The feedback of not seeing anything didn't discourage him. The third time he went, came back, didn't see anything. He didn't discourage Elijah. He had his eyes focused on the sound he heard. On the sound he heard. And he was going to stay in the place of prayer until that sound is converted into physical manifestation. That is what many people fail to do in their carous moment. That resulted into, you know, abortion of seasons. And when a season is missed, yes, other seasons will come, but you have to wait for it to come. You have to wait for it to come. Okay, that is the normal process. But as I'm speaking now, the Holy Ghost is reminding me, sometimes even the normal process of having to wait can be altered. But it takes certain things to alter it. Because we don't have the time, I can't tell you those things right now. I hope I'll be able to in the course of coming weeks. So, so somebody has missed a season, you can bring that season back. When you hear messages like this, there are certain things you can do to bring back those seasons and recreate it in the spirit and bring those things to bed. But otherwise, the typical thing is to wait for another Kairos season for the cloud to gather again and be full. So Elijah stayed in the place of prayer four times, three times, six times. The man kept coming back and saying, I don't see anything. How many people can stay in the place of prayer like that? Many times we give up too quickly. We give up, we quit too quickly. And that's why certain people, listen, your destiny, God can plan your, for your destiny to be very big. But you have a part to play in bringing it to, to pass. There are many people with potentially heavy destinies who have died as non-entities. Oh, yes. God said to Saul, listen, pay attention to this. God said to Saul, I had taught to make you king and your descendant. He said, but now it is over. I found a man after my heart who would feed me, who would, who would, who would um, I found a man after my heart. So what happened was that Saul's destiny was to be the first king in his lineage and, you know, start a lineage of kings. But he made certain moves that aborted that plan, that cut it short. So he was the only king in his lineage as a result of certain actions that he took, which was contrary to the plan of God. And then the mantle came on David. And because David took certain steps, God now said to David, listen, there will never be a time where there will cease to be a king from your loin. The covenant I have with you is a forever covenant. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Choices, decisions, and actions. Choices, decisions, and actions. Decisions determine destiny. Glory to Jesus. Sometimes one hour of prayer can save several generations. Just one hour. But many times we don't dare to make that sacrifice. Okay, so at the seventh time, what happened? In verse, finally the seventh time, New King James Version, please. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a, a cloud as small as a man's hand 
rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Before the rain began to fall, after the place of intercession, the next thing that happened was a cloud as small as a man's hand rising. So sometimes, sometimes God will give you a sign first to show you what's coming. Now it is your responsibility to, uh, to discern the tokens or the signs. To discern that this little testimony, even though it looks little, it is God showing me that something is about to happen. That should strengthen your faith and help you to stay, persevere with what you are doing. But sometimes Satan can use it to weaken people's faith and tell you, listen, after all your prayers, look at, is it this small sign that you are seeing? So it depends on perspective. You can see either from what God is saying and doing or you can pay attention to what the enemy is saying. There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariots and go down before the rain stops you. In other words, the rain that is about to fall is not going to be small. Give me the next verse. Give me the next verse. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. The cloud has gathered. There's about to be a rainfall. Is somebody here? I said the cloud has gathered. We've been praying. We've been praying. We've been in prayer for a while. Since late November. We've been praying. And we are not, we are, we are, we are not stopping yet. The cloud is gathering. I heard the sound. But it has moved from a sign to a sign. And it has moved from just a sign of a small feast. Hallelujah. I see the cloud black already. There's about to be a downpour. Is somebody listening to me? I said there's about to be a downpour. Elijah told Ahab, prepare. Are you preparing for what is coming? Something is coming. Something is coming. This year, 2024, we are going to see God exalt the body of Christ in this nation. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. The agent and the agency of darkness will be judged. It's going to happen right before you. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The heavens have gathered and it's still gathering. Gathering rain. Gathering rain. The rain will pour so heavily. 2024 will be a year to remember. In the name of Jesus Christ. 